Thank you very much. Uh, always happy to be here with you. It so happens that I have a subject that I've been wanting to talk about, uh, so it seems like this would be just as good a time as any. <clears throat> In the Bible, there are many things that are misunderstood and mistranslated into English that comes from what we call Hebrew. First of all, we need to understand that that which we refer to as Hebrew is in point of fact not Hebrew, but Canaanite, Phoenician Canaanite. The bloodline is from the ancient Middle East called the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians, uh, their area, that area in which Phoenicia existed was called Cana, the land of Cana. So today we refer to uh, the Canaanite, Phoenician Canaanite language as Hebrew. Uh, all you have to do is go to reference books and look up ancient Hebrew and it will tell you ancient Hebrew is actually, actually Phoenician Canaanite and it develops and, and mutates and comes down through history until today we call it Hebrew. But Hebrew is actually a Phoenician language. And many of the concepts and ideas which are expressed in the Old Testament are not uh, original to the Old Testament. They were, it goes back to of even further back into ancient history so that many of the concepts and belief systems in Judaism and Christianity are very, very ancient. And I believe that the Bible is one of the most important books on the earth because it's really telling you some really interesting things, but uh, if you don't understand how to read the symbols, it's never going to dawn on you how this stuff works. Uh, I think the New Testament is probably the most important story in the whole world, but not as history, but as a metaphor, as an encoded message. Uh, but let me go back to this one subject that I'm been very interested in for a long time, and that is in the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis 1, 1, says in the King James Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But that's not what it says in the old ancient Hebrew or Phoenician language. That's not what it says in the original language. That's how it was translated from the English in the King's English. Well, the King's English, uh, the, the, the King James Version, was translated by the best translators that the king had at the time. And it was very well done. Uh, however, they know more about the language today than what they did then. And so there's a lot of imperfections in the King James Bible that could be misleading unless you understand what the words actually meant in the ancient world. And so when you read in the beginning, this is Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's not what it says in Hebrew. It says, in the beginning of the creation, Elohim, El Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. Elohim is not the word God. El is a Phoenician, Canaanite name or word for deity, El, E-L. We talked a little bit about that last week. Lohim is uh, like adding an S onto an English word. You have C-A-R for car, or C-A-R-S, cars, more than one. So adding an S on the end, uh, to the end of most English words means it's uh, plural, in the plural. Well, that's exactly what El Lohim means. El is God, Lohim is plural. So the correct understanding should be read, the Hebrew read, in the beginning, the gods created the heavens and the earth, not God. And more interesting than that, this is why, incidentally, in Genesis 1.28, when God is creating uh, Adam and Eve, the first couple, and it says, God said, come, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Who's us and our? Was God talking to himself? Come, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Later on in Genesis, I think it's three, the scripture says, God said, here man has become as one of us. 
knowing good and evil. The point is, who is God talking about? Us. He, here is man made in our image after looking like us. Here, now he's like us. Who's us? Who's our? Well, it's El Elohim, the gods. So consequently, what we're talking about here is that the gods created us, created the heavens and the earth and all things on it. Now, more important to my, and this is the whole subject, of course, you could take this, uh, you know, in many different directions. But interesting in Genesis 1, 2, says, and the earth was without form and void. That's another mistranslation. And the original, uh, it does not say that the earth was without form and void. Actually, it says, and the earth became a waste and a desolation. Not form and void, but waste and desolation. And it was not, as I said, the scripture, if you read it today in the Bible, Genesis 1-2, says, and the earth was without form and void. No. The earth became a waste and a desolation. Consequently, um, if you go to Genesis 9, which is Genesis 9, 1, where God is talking to Noah after the flood of Noah's day, and God says to Noah, uh, now understanding that according to the story, everyone has been wiped off the earth in the great flood, and so God says to Noah and his sons, his three sons, uh, go forth into the world now and multiply and replenish the earth. And you ask the question, wait a minute, the word is re, R-E, replenish the earth, meaning, not plenish, replenish, meaning do it again. Why? Well, simply because before Noah, there was a whole civilization. God brings a flood, according to the story, God brings a flood, destroys the world and all life on it. And now God is saying to Noah and his sons and, and their wives, go now on the earth and reproduce and fill the earth and replenish the earth. Well, that is a correct translation from the Hebrew, and I've talked to rabbis about that. And the word is replenish, R-E, means do it again. Okay, it makes sense that God would be telling Noah to redo it again. However, if you go back to Genesis 1.28, where God is creating the first chapter of the Bible, where God is creating man uh, and man and woman, Adam and Eve, he says to Adam and Eve, multiply and replenish the earth. Do it again. Replenish the earth implying, <clears throat> of course, do it again. What are you talking about doing again? Well, if you just read Genesis 1-2 correctly, it said, and the earth was without form and void. No, the earth became a waste and a desolation. So the rabbis will tell you, and the rabbinical reference works will tell you, that what is being said in Genesis 1-2 and in 128 when man's, man and woman are being created is that God is recreating all over again. And so consequently, the Bible, the Old Testament, is, is a story for this dispensation. This time, the world is being recreated. Now, what happened... Uh, a million years ago, 10,000 or 100,000 years ago, that's none of your business. For you right now, this is what you need to understand. And the bottom line is, is that we are not the first creatures on the earth, the, the first time man's been on the earth. We now know that man has been on the earth probably millions and millions of years, and that for us to think that mankind was created 6,000, 7,000, 10,000 years ago is ludicrous because we know better than that. And so consequently, that's what the Bible is saying. God is saying, replenish the earth to Adam and Eve. Do it again. <clears throat> Who is God? Well, the scripture says, and this is a very difficult word to deal with, God, G-O-D, because uh, you know, that, that's a lot of baggage. What are you talking about when you talk about God? 
Well, God is dog spelled backwards, as I said. This is why churches have dogma in their teachings, because it goes back to Anubis, Anubis the dog star, Anubis the dog, the god of uh, and the ancient Egyptian religion. But when you look at the word, and now I get back to what I was going to say to start with, that in Genesis 1-2, where it incorrectly says, and in the, in the, in the earth was without form and void, no, the earth became a waste and a desolation. The two Hebrew words that are being translated there is tohu and vohu. Uh, pronunciation, it would be T-O-E hyphen W-H-O, tohu. That's not the way it's spelled in Hebrew, but that's the way it's pronounced. T-O-E W-H-O, tohu. Vohu would be V-O-E W-H-O, tohu, vohu, waste, desolation. There's only two places in the Bible where tohu vohu is used, and it's uh, and those two places they're always used together. And there's only two places to start with. One is in Jeremiah, and one is in Genesis one two. And the the in the scripture in Jeremiah, Jeremiah says, "I saw the earth in a vision, and the earth was tohu vohu." Meaning the earth became, and my eyes I saw the earth and it became a waste and a desolation. Well, when did that happen? Well, according to the Jeremiah prophecy, it happened many, many, many thousands of years before, and the prophet Isaiah said God gave him a vision, and in the vision he saw the earth and tohu vohu, which is the earth became in his eyes. It was beautiful, it was, and the scripture says that, Jeremiah says, and the earth was beautiful, its animals, its birds, uh, its civilizations were absolutely beautiful to see, and then tohu vohu, it became a waste and a desolation, meaning that there, the earth probably was a very beautiful uh, place thousands and thousands of years ago, maybe a hundred thousand years ago, and Jeremiah was given the opportunity to see the way the earth was 30, 40, 50,000 years ago with animals and a whole different beautiful world and then something happened, some kind of a major catastrophe, tohu vohu, it became a waste and a desolation. Now, when you go back to Genesis 1-2, tohu vohu is always understood to be a situation that the earth goes through when it changes from what the ancients called one dispensation to another dispensation, or one period of time in God's history, not our history, but in the history of the universal God force, the way it keeps time. And of course, it's, you know, it, it, uh, one, one day is a thousand years. Well, that's probably more than that. Uh, theoretically, using the term God, how does God keep time? Well, my Lord, you know, God's forever, forever. So, I mean, how long would that be? So in the, the universal God force concept of time, millions of years are nothing. So consequently, what is being said there is that tohu vohu implies a total destruction on a cosmic level between dispensations of creation between God between the time that God created the earth and all these wonderful things were on it, say, 100,000 years ago, and then when something happened, a comet hit the uh, earth is one, one of the ideas that's going around now, a major comet the size of New York hit in south of uh, Mexico and, and caused the dust to fly all over the earth and everything died because it blocked out the sun. I don't know, but, but something happened because we know that animals, even in the North Pole, the South Pole, they have found animals that are frozen solid with green vegetation still in their mouth. Consequently, something happened many, many, many thousands of years ago, which is translated tohu vohu. Some terrible catastrophe happened on the earth in which the gods were angry and, and the whole thing was just leveled. 
Well, maybe it wasn't the gods who did it, but the point being is that the Bible is saying that the gods, Elohim, became angry at the creation, and Jeremiah was allowed to see tohu vohu, a total uh, destruction all over the earth, a major catastrophe. And that is precisely, as I said, the words and the concept is used for the dispensation of one creative period going to another creative period. So when everything is collapsed and destroyed, now theoretically, according to the Bible, God says, come, let us do it again. All right, let's start all over again and let's create a man and a woman and Rabbi Marvin S. Antelman. Some 35 years ago, Marvin Antelman, A-N-T-E-L-M-A-N-N, Marvin T Antelman uh, of Newton, Massachusetts, was 35 years ago president of the American Rabbinical Association. And he and I were very close friends for many years. And I used to chide him all the time about his understandings of the Bible. But, uh, but uh, Rabbi Antelman, president of the American Rabbinical Association, said to me, I asked him about that scripture, where God said, come, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And I said to Rabbi, what are you talking about, come, let us? Who's us? Did God get, to get, get permission from somebody else that's working with him or what? And he says, no, it's a misunderstanding on how the sentence is understood by Gentiles and Jews. Jews also misunderstand. They don't know any more than the Gentiles do. There is a correct way to read that sentence. And... The, the correct, the, the normal way people think that the scripture is saying when it says God said come let us make man in our image after our likeness. Most people think that that's, God is saying come let us create a creature. Let us make a, a, a new creation, a creature and we will call him, uh, uh, maybe we'll call him man. So come let us make a creature and we will call him man and woman. Man with a womb, womb man. And that's what most people understand that scripture to mean. That's not what it says at all. Rabbi Antelman says, nowhere in the Bible does it say God created man. It doesn't say that. Go back and read it correctly. What is said is that God said, or Elohim, the gods said, come, let us make man in our image after our likeness. The correct way to understand that is the gods were saying, come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Not make man, man's already here. Come let us remake man, do it again. Let us make man according to our image and our likeness. And so the, 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 ancient, uh, the ancient Jews and the Hebrews and all the ancient civilizations that were starting all the way back to Samaria understood what, what was being said. It's just that we don't understand because we, all we get is our news from ABC. We wouldn't know anything about what's going on. But if you go back to the ancient works, you will find that the ancient people, the Sumerians, Babylonians, Phoenician Canaanites, Egyptians, the ancient Greeks and Romans, all of them understood that we are the creation of another, of another entity. We are the creation of the gods. And according to Zachariah Sitchin, and he's not the only one, he's just one that I know personally, but according to the work of Zachariah Sitchin, the Sumerians are saying that extraterrestrials came here from a planet called Nibiru. And Nibiru is, according to the Sumerians, they said that Nibiru is a planet about twice the size of the Earth, and that comes and it is part of our solar system, but it has a huge elliptical orbit. It's not a round orbit, it's elliptical orbit, oblong. And consequently, according to the Sumerians, and now we're beginning to scientifically find out that he was right, the Sumerians were right. The U.S. Navy has even commented on now that there seems to be more than one other planet connected to our solar system with elliptical orbits. Well, that's what the Sumerians were saying. And consequently, this elliptical orbit is every 3,600 years, it comes back into our vicinity and passes through our solar system, then goes back out again. 
and according to the way the solar system turns in the galaxy, and this thing comes back every 3,600 years, comes back and then goes back out. And consequently, every 3,600 years, mankind seems to make massive movements on the earth, new things, new technology. All of a sudden, things just start happening. Why? I believe that there's at least enough um, evidence to show that there might be something to this story that the Sumerians and the Egyptians and all these great civilizations, not us, we, you know, we have no idea what's going on in right here in our own city, but the ancient peoples knew and said that the gods told them that every 3,600 years they come back through, and when they come back through, why travel a long distance when they could just wait, the planet's going to be in the close vicinity, and when it is, it'll be here for a few months, so they will drop off and see how everything is, and uh, and give you some new up up uh, uh, you know some new concepts and new ideas uh, depending on how smart you are. If you're still as dumb as last time they were here, you know why bother? But if you've progressed a little bit, they will give you a little bit more to work on. Then they get on the planet and leave, and another 3,600 years goes by, and mankind progresses again. So all of this makes some kind of a uh, of, of a legitimate sense if you are able to look at science, philosophy, religion, biblical history, and, and be able to you know, balance it all out. There is a lot of, there is a modicum of truth in all of this because uh, scientifically things are being proven now that the Sumerians were saying many thousands of years ago. So the point being is that God said, come let us make man in our image after our likeness. Um, interesting. In relation to that, and again, I go back and, and reiterate that Rabbi Antoman said the correct way to, to, to say that or to read that scripture is that the gods said, come let us make man in our image. Not make man, but let's make him in our image, after our likeness. Uh, well, that's, that's interesting. You mean we were already here, but for being so great, we weren't that great. Yeah, we were hominids. We were Neanderthal man. We were Cro-Magnon man. We were whatever these creatures were that were digging up all over the world. In the south of France, we're finding Neanderthal who stand upright, uh, homo sapien, but, uh, but they were just a little different from us. And, but they, they had certain qualities that showed that they had some intelligence about how to do things. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, from the Neanderthal period, we pop in. Our, our skin and flesh is different than what the Neanderthals would have been. Our, our skin is thinner. We can't take the cold like animals do at 2 o'clock in the morning on the desert when it's like 20 below zero. Animals are out there. They live through it. We couldn't. Why? It's because our, our bodies are designed differently, our skin is thinner, our systems are more balanced and, 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 uh, and vulnerable. Uh, however, our spirituality and our intellect is far higher. We, we can appreciate geometry, uh, uh, sciences, occultism, beautiful music, uh, lasers. I mean, you know, our intellectual and spiritual capacity is phenomenal. But our bodies are very uh, vulnerable. So what happened in our natural evolution of things when one time you have the, the Neanderthals or whatever these hominid creatures, and that's a word that science use, hominids, these creatures, and all of a sudden we appear. Well, it makes sense to me that perhaps there is something to what the Sumerians said, that the gods who came through on Nibiru or whatever the planet was or whatever the story is, the bottom line is that the gods said, come, let us make man in our image after our likeness, meaning they must have cross-breeded their DNA with our DNA, whichever the, the normal uh, hominid creatures that were here, take one of the females, impregnate the female with the, with the genetics of the gods, and the outcome would have been us. We are still animalistic, I mean, at best. 
uh, we're still animalistic. We're still going around killing people and shooting people and anybody that doesn't look like us or happen to be our color, we hate them and we shoot them. Uh, we shoot our own families, you know, we shoot presidents, we shoot everybody. Why? It's because we are actually a Neanderthal, ancient, uh, uh, hominid creature. And we have appetites for violence and, and excitement and killing and all that kind of thing. However, we also, uh, as among us, those who are profoundly brilliant and spiritually in tune, who give us the great uh, composers, the great poets, the greatness that mankind is capable of. So you have the balance, the animalistic human plus the divinely inspired. So we can, you know, we're balanced. The bottom line on this is that we are created by the gods. Now, go back to Genesis 18, and in Genesis 18, there's a story there about Abraham. And Abraham is standing in his tent talking to his wife, the scripture says. Go read it in the Bible in Genesis 18. And it says, and Abraham was standing in his tent, and three men come walking up toward him. And he went out to meet them. And, he, and they talked with the men, and they said that they were on their way to some business they had elsewhere, and they were just passing through. And it says Abraham uh, invited them to stay and have dinner at least, because this was a custom in the ancient world. If you have tourists or people coming through, it doesn't matter who they are. That was a custom in the ancient world. You show hospitality by asking them if at least you can stop and have something to eat or something, refresh yourself and then go. And so that was the custom. Um, you know, we still do that today. You know, friends drop over, you'll fix them something to eat or something. So that was a custom. But it's interesting that in Genesis 18, it says Abraham asked the three men to stay and have dinner and then go. And they said no, they were busy. They had something they had to do. And it said that Abraham insisted. So they said, all right, not going to argue. We'll have dinner, but make it quick because we've got something to do, but we'll stay for a few minutes. So it says Abraham had Sarah make, uh, make something to eat. And after eating, two of the men got up, thanked Abraham for his hospitality and said, but they really must go. But the third one stayed to talk for a little bit. And then later on, and that's in Genesis 18. In the next chapter, Genesis 19, you find out that those two men are now the two men who are in Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 19. And it says that when those two men who were, you know, the day before with Abraham are now in Sodom and Gomorrah, it says the homosexuals thought they were good-looking, handsome men. And it said that the homosexuals that night came to the house where these two men were staying with Lot and, and called them out uh, and, and the two men were able to supernaturally cause the people of the town to become blind so that they started fighting among themselves. And it says that the two men in the Bible, Genesis 19, were in point of fact actually angels, spirit entities who have come in a human form. And it says in Genesis 18 that the one that stayed and talked with uh, Abraham was in fact the Lord God, the creator himself. God Almighty, the creator of mankind himself, was the Lord who sat with Abraham. And I think to myself, wait a minute. You mean Abraham actually fixed dinner for God, for the creator? And he sat there and had, you know, had dinner and a couple of drinks and, and chit-chatted with Abraham and talked to his wife. And he was said to be a man. He looked like a man. He acted like a man. Uh, take that into consideration with later on in Genesis when it says the sons of God. And sons of God does not mean angels. Angels and sons of God are totally different, uh, totally different subjects. Angels are not sons of God. But in the, uh, later on in Genesis it says sons of God began to forsake their proper dwelling place and start cohabiting with women. The sons of God began to see women, that they were beautiful, and, and fell for the women. And this is where we get the idea of falling in love, because they fell from a higher position because of the women. And so consequently, um, I cannot picture myself uh, 
seeing a woman being talked into bed by some hideous creature from another world, but good-looking, handsome men might do it. So consequently, it makes sense that the sons of God were good-looking, handsome men. Even the homosexuals thought they were good-looking, handsome men. The point being is that the angels, the sons of God, the, the, not the angels, but the sons of God, there were two of them that accompanied the almighty God, the creator, Yahweh, Jehovah. And what is this all saying? The bottom line after everything is said and done is quite simply this, that we are told that God, the creator, had two uh, accompanying angels with him, he went into Sodom and Gomorrah. They looked like men. They sat down. They had dinner. They could chit-chat with you. And, they, uh, and two of them left to go, and they all looked like men. And later on, the sons of God, who looked like handsome, good-looking men, they started messing around with women and had offspring. Well, their plumbing must have worked if they had offspring through females. So they must have been, uh, for all practical purposes, a man. What is this saying? It's basically saying this. I believe that there is a modicum of truth in the story that's encoded in the book of Genesis. I think there is something there very important. I think that today there very well could be sons of God still here on the earth. We don't know what their lifespan is. We don't know how long sons of God, Elohim, or the Anunnaki, as the, uh, as the ancient Sumerians call them. We don't know how long they live. We have no idea what we're talking about here. All we know is the Bible is saying that there are extraterrestrials, and I have to tell you this, but that's the word, extraterrestrial, because God and the angels, or the sons of God, do not come from Van Nuys. They come from out there. They come from somewhere out there in, quote, heaven, end quote. So if they're coming from out there and they look like humans and they can mess with women and have offspring, they can sit and have dinner with you, and they look like good and handsome men, but they're not from here and they're not men. They just look like men. That begins to make sense to me that perhaps what we are seeing today in the Middle East having to do with, I with, the, with the Iraq, <clears throat> which Iraq was originally hundreds of years ago called Persia. Persia was called before that um, Chaldea. Chaldea before that was called Babylon. So what we're talking about is the king of Babylon. Now it begins to look like what's going on here is that our world is being run by very powerful men who cared nothing whatsoever about human creatures. Do you care and worry yourself sick when you go to Kentucky Fried Chicken and think about how many innocent families were broken up, how many chickens had to die? You couldn't care less. They're just chickens. They're just animals. And so consequently, I think that the uh, sons of God, the Elohim, Anonaki, I don't care what name you give them, they are still here. I am totally convinced that we are now seeing in the Middle East with the United States government doing what it's doing, with the rest of the world preparing for something, tohu vohu. I think what we're actually seeing is a profound, awesome, terrible tribulation coming when the gods are going to battle like two men fighting over a woman. The gods are going to battle for the ownership of us. And consequently, when you understand that Saddam Hussein is Persian, Persia is Chaldean, Chaldean is Babylon. And we talked in the Bible, the Bible is filled with, uh, in the book of Genesis and all the way through to Revelation, talks about how the gods of Babylon were, were to be cursed and they were evil and that the good God was going to destroy Babylon. I think what we're seeing right now is in, in Israel, America, England, when you begin to look at the symbols, the words, the terms, the national coats of arms, the, the seals of nations, listen to what the president is saying, I am totally convinced 
for my own self, and I've been looking at this for over 40 years. I'm totally convinced what's going on right now is that the President of the United States has no control over anything. I think that those, what's going on is there are very powerful, awesome creatures on this earth that look like men, and they act like men, and they can eat with you, but they are not normal human beings. These people are despotically powerful, murderous in their intent. They don't care a thing about human life because they created it. They don't give a damn about nations, races, children, uh, family values. That's all crap to them. They created this creature called man. They are in a whole different world than we are. They don't see the same things. Their, their technology is so far above us. Their understanding of human creation is so far above anything we understand. They are, as far as we're concerned, gods. Consequently, I think that what we're seeing now is a war between the gods, and consequently, tohu vohu. I believe that it's my opinion that we're going to see in the next two and a half years uh, trouble like we have never seen it before. It's frightening the implications of what I, I just think back on the gods and when they're at war. You like, you like war and you like bloodshed? Well, stick around. Now you're going to see how the gods do it. You're going, you, you know, you love, America loves all these war movies? Good. Stick around. You're going to really want to see this one because the gods are going to show you what war is really all about. And it hasn't got a thing to do with sparing the children and only dropping bombs on military. And not, no, no. The gods, they don't give a damn about none of it. They're here to do one thing, and that is control and take ownership of us, their, their creation. Incidentally, if the concept that I have, I have outlined that we creatures, we humans, are actually the offspring of the gods are some kind of a mating uh, action between the extraterrestrials or the Elohim, uh, Anunnaki, the ancient gods, whatever you want to call them. If there is something to this, if there is any validity to this concept that extraterrestrials who came from heaven, yeah, of course, if they came here and they said, come, let us create man or make man in our image and our likeness. You've got a very interesting situation here. You have Neanderthal or hominid creatures, and we haven't even discussed where the hominid creatures came from. We're not even dealing with that yet. <clears throat> but you're talking about an extraterrestrial life forms that look like us, and they have come here from another world, from, an, another, uh, from another place in time. And they are attempting to procreate with the indigenous creatures that are here. And consequently, their DNA and their system, or their body system from where the world they have come from, is so superior to ours. And yet, they are smart enough to know how to blend our DNA, the creatures, the hominid creatures, with them. Is this how we got today? Um, uh, the Yetis, abominable snowman, the Yetis, um, what are some of the other terms that are used for those creatures? Uh, what is it? Bigfoot. Bigfoot. Yeah, Bigfoot, uh, uh, the Yetis, whatever. They are hominid creatures. They walk on two legs like, like male. They look like men, but they are animals. But they are brilliant in intelligence and can outsmart anybody. They have obviously supernatural powers to go in and out of, of dimensions. There's a lot of material on that subject. So, and too many races of people around the world, from China to Asia to uh, North America to all of the ancient cultures, talk about the, uh, the Bigfoot, the Yetis, those mysterious creatures that live in the wilds. It would not surprise me if those Yetis, Bigfoot creatures, are the original experiments of the Anunnaki gods 
cohabiting and, and, and cross-breeding with the hominid creatures that were here, but they put too much of something in and not enough of the other, and they came out even more vicious than what they were and even smarter. But they're still animals. Well, they screwed up. Okay, <clears throat> now we got to do it a, 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 something better because this thing was, before it was just an animal. Now it's a vicious animal, and it has supernatural powers like we do. Uh, so, all right, and that thing's already gone. Let's forget it. Let's move it on and do it again now. This time we're going to do it better, and so now they do it again. And now they got it right. Now they got it balanced and got the DNA correct and got it right and gave birth to us. So I'm saying, if any of this has any validity, and I'm just putting, I'm just pointing this material out because this is what the Bible says. And so consequently, if any of this has any validity, it very well might be, as uh, my friend um, uh, William Henry has been talking about for many years, and Zachariah and all the rest of them, I think that we might be seeing a war being put together right now, not by men. It is very possible that we in this country and the world in general is being led. We have talked about Illuminati, the secret societies, the fraternal orders, even among uh, the Masons of Europe. When you confront uh, the Masons of Europe and you ask them, who actually is at the top of your organization? At the very top, who are they? They will tell you that they don't know. That is not to be, un that's not to be discussed. They don't know who is at the top, and it's none of your business. And you want to stay alive and just do what you're doing, then you just take care of your business at this level and don't worry about who the boss is. And consequently, the, the Masons in Europe refer to their masters as, quote, the hidden chiefs or hidden masters. Somehow or another, the hidden masters behind world events, today we refer to them as Illuminati or whatever. Uh, I don't think the Bilderbergers and the Council on Foreign Relations and any of those organizations are of any importance to me at all. Those are just the mundane uh, nuts and bolts of how the, the organizations put together to make things work. I'm more interested as to who are the gods behind world affairs? Who are the brilliant minds at the top of the pyramid symbolically? Who are the intellectual elites behind world events? I'm totally sure there's only a handful, a very small, tiny handful, and I wouldn't be a bit surprised if they were the Elohim, the Anunnaki, the men who look like men but are not men. Consequently, I, you know, so many people have said, how can these people go to war killing innocent women and children, uh, you know, like the First and Second World War, murdering and killing? Uh, how could men do this? I don't think men are doing it at all. I think that there are, par there are powerful entities in this world who look like men, and they give the orders, and you better jump. And I don't care if you call yourself president, just don't matter. If you get in their way, they'd sooner kill you as anybody else. They got an agenda, and you had better jump when they say. And consequently, I think that's what we're looking at today, a war between the gods. It has nothing to do with the human uh, element. It has to do with a, co a, a cosmic, cataclysmic time in which the gods are battling now for our ownership. This is what Steven Spielberg and George Lucas have been telling you. Steven Spielberg in his movie, uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. You need to go back and get the movie and watch it. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. What is the Last Crusade? Well, if you don't understand the first two crusades, you're never going to understand the Last Crusade. Do you know what the Crusades were all about? Do you know who started the Crusades? And what were, what were they crusading about? Well, it has to do with the ownership of people, international banking cartels. It has to do with the Knights Templars of the 9th and 10th century. So consequently, what, if you don't understand what the first two crusades or the first three crusades, then you're not going to understand Indiana Jones and the last crusade. 
What is the last crusade about? It has Indiana Jones looking for something called the cup of Christ or the Holy Grail. The cup of Christ, the Holy Grail, uh, there have been many, many stories and many interpretations of this, but basically it goes, it goes back to one thing. The cup represents the holder of the wine. The wine is poured into the cup. The cup the wine has always represented the blood of mankind. Jesus said, drink this wine, for this is the blood of the covenant. So you drink the wine, all of the men around the table would drink the wine. They are symbolically drinking the blood of the God so that they are locked into a partnership with God. You're drinking the wine, which is a ritual. The, the wine represents the blood and in the Christian sense, it, were, it represents Jesus' blood that's being shed for us. So you're drinking the blood, taking a, an oath to lock yourselves together in a, in a sacred mission. All right, but the, the Holy Grail, the, the lost Grail, is a cup in which you pour the wine. The cup represents the earth, and the wine represents the blood on the earth. So the cup represents the earth, the human blood on the earth is the wine in the cup. Consequently, whoever holds the cup holds the blood of the human family on the earth in his hand, which I believe is a symbolism of the ancient gods who have come here from another world and they are saying, who owns this property down here? You know, well, we created it. Ah, uh -uh, you created it, but we own it. We're coming in and taking it over. And that's why uh, Saddam Hussein has said he believes he is the reincarnation of uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. I got a feeling that there's some really powerful, strange occultism going on in the Middle East right now. And we in America and England, the Western man is getting ready to get involved and become cannon fodder. We're going to become involved in a war that you have no idea in the world how big it's going to be. Because this has nothing to do with generals sitting down and plotting out some war plan. No, no, no. This is going to be one hell of a conflict. It's, it's going to be a cosmic conflict between the gods and even today, Christians are beginning to realize this is the things which are talked about in the Bible prophecies. We are in the time of the end. Yes, we are in the time of the end of the age of Pisces. And the coming age, and by 2012, we will be fully into, according to the reference works, we'll be fully into what is called the beginning of the age of Aquarius. Uh, that is simply dispensations of time, 2,150 years of the age of the fish. That's why Christians have the fish on the back of the cars. And the water bearer, which is, a, which is Aquarius. So what the Bible is saying is that there is one age that's leaving, that's a 2,150 year period, and another 2,150 period is going to begin, and who are going to be the gods of the new age, the gods of the new order of things? Well, it's like a, a prize fight heavyweight champion uh, prize fight. We're going to have to fight this one out, see who the best man is. You know, the two guys fighting over the woman. So consequently, I think what we're beginning to see and what we're going to see very soon is an all-out cosmic war in which we're going to also see, I think we're going to be uh, privy to see supernatural things going on, not just in this war, not just in war, I think we're going to see some really strange phenomena being able to, uh, you know, people are going to see it for themselves. Norio Hayakawa, dear friend of mine, I just spoke uh, this past week at the Japanese uh, Friendship Club in, in uh, Little Tokyo uh, for Norio. Uh, but Norio has been saying for many years, Norio is famous for his work with Area 51, but Norio Hayakawa has said so often, that he believes that the United States government and probably the world government behind it is planning on having some kind of a UFO uh, extravaganza that they're going to do themselves. It's going to be a show 
and it's going to be the aliens landing here from another world, and they're going to cause this and that to happen, and therefore all the nations are going to have to get together to fight this alien race that's here. And the whole thing is a show to fool everyone into joining a new world order collectively. Uh, and, and the whole thing will be a trick, and the trick is going to be so well done, the, the most ardent skeptic is going to believe it because it's really going to be a hot show. But nonetheless, as, as, uh, as Noriel says, the whole thing is a put-up job. Well, I said to Noriel one night at a dinner at, after one of the lectures we were doing together at the table, and a bunch of the speakers were there, and, it was in, and I said to Noriel, Noriel, I can take the same facts that you enumerated tonight that back up your theory. I could take the same exact facts and come up with a different theory that fits it equally as well. And I would say, it's just my opinion, but I could take the same facts you've come up with. You said that they were here, that they were doing this and that, and that they're going to land and make it look like. I wonder if it isn't going to be an actual, in fact, invasion of extraterrestrials invading us. I, I would be, not be a bit surprised if the U.S. government knows that it's going to happen. They've already been told that these gods are going to do battle with other gods who are coming here for the ownership of the earth and that you are, and, and the governments of the world of this earth are being told either you're with us or you're with them. And you had better be with us because we're already here and they're coming and they are our enemies. And so it's a war between the gods for the ownership of the earth and consequently if that be the case you better sue for peace with one of the two. And logic would tell you that if one of them is already here, that's the one you better sue for peace with. And so I said to Norio, it may very well be that it's not going to be a staged event. I think maybe they're actually going to be a, an extraterrestrial uh, intervention into our, uh, into our civilization. And we might be seeing things from another world that are legitimately real. So I, and these are all the things which were prophesied in the Bible. They're prophesied in the ancient uh, Hopi um, prophecies. In the Mayans, the Incas, all of the ancient peoples uh, have prophesied that the gods would come back. They're coming back. Well, what are you talking about coming back? Every 3,600 years, Nibiru comes through, a planet comes through, in which we are told by the Sumerians, those people from Nibiru, uh, who have come from another planet and another world look like us and they created or recreated us and they're coming back and they're not very happy with us and they're not very happy with the alien life forms who are here who have been manipulating us and using us. It's like one gang coming in and finding out another gang has set up shop here and they say, hey, wait a minute. You know, just because we went down to the store, that don't mean you come in here and take over. Well, we're already here. What are you going to do about it? Well, we'll show you what we're going to do about it. And now all of a sudden, the people in the neighborhood, they better get out of here because there's going to be a war. And it's not because they're trying to protect you. It's ownership. Somebody came here and created us. And they're coming back, and they're going to find out others are here. And they're taking over our planet. So I'm saying that there's a very good chance that there is a whole nother story in the Bible uh, encoded and from my talking with rabbis and, and looking at the subject I think there is something legitimate about all of this I do not discard the Bible both Old and New Testament I think there's some very interesting and important material in there I just don't think we have fully understood it yet it's a lot of encoded stuff again tohu vohu means cosmic destruction on a cosmic level and if we, in fact, if, if we, in fact, begin to see two opposing forces of gods, alien life forms from other worlds that have, we all know, technology we don't even understand, and if they begin an all-out war between themselves on this earth we are going to see some extraordinary destruction some very very powerful 
and fearful things, and this is what the scripture says. It says in Isaiah that men are going to beg God to die and for the mountains to call, crawl in over them. They're going to wish that they were dead and that people are going to be having, uh, in Jeremiah it says men will be having heart attacks about thinking about what's coming. They can already see it coming, the implications. I think tohu and vohu, cosmic destruction on a cosmic level is about to begin. I think that's exactly what's now on the way. This is why the powers that be in America are so dead strong and so locked in on what they're going to do is because they have no alternative. The people who are actually running this government from behind the scenes, we call it the world government or the Illuminati or the secret societies, no, I think the people who are running this thing from behind the scenes are not even human. And what they got planned according to their own agenda for ownership of us is going to be one hell of a war. And at this point, I would conclude by saying I believe the only hope that we have as individual humans I, I am totally convinced because of too much has, has proven this to me that over and above this scenario, if it has any validity at all, over and above this scenario, bad as it is, there is above the, the, the scenario a higher power in the universe that men have called, for a lack of a better term, God. There are many terms that can be used for God the divine presence in the universe, the Holy Spirit, I don't care what you call it because all nations, uh, races and peoples on the earth have acknowledged the presence of, quote, it, end quote, whatever it is, but it's there. If you choose to call it God or the divine, incidentally the word divine comes from the idea that the grapes, uh, the, the red wine represents the blood and the blood represents life and it came from the vine. And so that's why it's the blood comes from the divine, the vine. But I don't care if you call God the divine one, the Holy Spirit, the great father. It doesn't matter what you call that presence in the universe. There is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that there is a higher power in the universe that watches these skirmishes between races in its great creation. And I would suggest that all of us uh, the way to protect yourself is the way the scripture is said to do it and the way that the New Testament admonishes to do it and that is to verbally, verbally uh, by yourself when no one is around uh, audibly talk to the spirit as if the spirit were a very highly intelligent powerful man or woman that you were talking to if you were talking to a very powerful dignitary, you would not jumble your words. You were very, very specific in what you want to say. Have the highest of respect for that one that you're speaking before. And once you have said your piece before the king and before that high official, then drop it. That's it. You've said your piece. He has heard it. It's over. Now, he will do whatever he decides to do in your behalf, but it's over. You don't need to explain anything more or, or whine about it. And so I think that this is the most powerful thing that an individual can do, is talk to the creator, the, the divine spirit in the universe, ask for direction, ask what am I to, supposed to know, what am I supposed to do, how can I protect myself and my loved ones, show me what I am to know, show me what I am to do, and I will listen, I will do whatever it is. No matter how wrong I am, I will listen, you show me. What you need to understand that once you do that, Jesus, the scripture has Jesus saying, you have not because you ask not. It is a, it is a normal thing in human communications. If you ask someone for something, they now have the, the option to grant the wish or not grant the wish. Well, if you go before a very powerful king or a very powerful man and ask him for something, don't make a, a nuisance out of yourself. You've asked, you've asked, and, and he has heard, and he'll decide. Maybe he decides no. But whatever he de the decision is, that's it anyway. 
So consequently, I believe that the smart thing, if you're concerned about your spirituality and your life, is to quietly talk to God or talk to the universe of God for us, because believe me, it's there and it hears you, and ask, what am I to do? What am I to know? Show me where I'm wrong. Tell me what I have to do, and I'm going to do it. Then leave it alone and watch the way the Spirit works. Things will begin to happen around you. And all of a sudden, you know, things will begin to, to pop up in front of you. Think, you'll, you'll be asking a question, and it will come on television. You'll open up a magazine, and there it is, the answer, right in front of you. And you think that's by chance? No, you asked God for direction, didn't you? So the scripture says God works in strange ways, his, his wonders to accomplish. So I'm saying that we are in a very perilous time, tohu vohu, cosmic things are going to happen. But I believe that there is a higher force in the universe. Talk to that spirit and it will protect you and guide you because all wise men have always said that and it's true and I want to thank you for your time. Thank you, Jordan, by the way. I hope you guys liked it. Was it good? Uh, was it good? You guys liked it? Good. I'm glad. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, we just made a bunch of tapes for Kathleen Keating and the father. So we'll play one of them for you. Which one would you like to hear? Keating? Okay. I'm going to go grab two sets. We'll play them. While uh, Wendy is away on business, uh, I'll entertain some questions if you have any, and not necessarily do I have the answers, if you have any questions. First of all, thank you, Jordan. Uh, the spirit you're talking about that we speak to, there was a uh, great religious leader in this century named Mosendar. Who? Mosendar. And he uh, communicated with this spirit, mm -hmm. and it was, uh, a God, and the way he did it was, he he talked to the spirit, and he'd answer for the spirit. And this went on for for months, and all of a sudden, his voice came out of nowhere, and he started to communicate it with this spirit, like you were talking about. Anyway, right. thank you again. Yeah, that's, I've had too many examples of that happening in my own life. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I know that when you speak, there is uh, scientific evidence for the idea that whatever you say lasts forever. The vibration is in the air, and it's there forever. There are scientists and physicists today who I've talked with up in Portland who were saying that there is at least a concept I don't know if they've done it yet, but the concept is there of uh, being able to pull out of the air the vibrations of the, of the things which Pharaoh said, which all the ancient peoples of the world said, it's all still here. It's, it's in the Akashic record, so to speak. It's all still here and can be recorded and can be tapped into if you have the right instruments to tap into that very high esoteric science of of things which were said thousands of years ago are still in the air. And so uh, I wouldn't be a bit surprised that there is some technology yet to come that can do that. Uh, I know because of my own personal experiences of being able to talk to the spirit and later on having magnificently strange stuff happen that just blows my mind. I mean, things which are 
uh, actually fear-inspiring and the implications of what happened. I asked for something, and when it happened, it happened in such a profound way that it was kind of scary to me. And then I thought, the Spirit is saying, hey, you asked, didn't you? You have not, for you asked not. You asked, and I, and I, and I answered you. Now, just because you turned white and was frightened to death uh, at the implications of it, uh, that's the way God is. I mean, it's a very powerful force at work right now. Very interesting stuff going on. So while I'm very displeased and very disheartened at seeing what's going on, I know that there's one higher than the high one who looks on, and, and what goes around comes around. And millions, millions of people died before. Millions will still die, but there is a higher dimension to reality. Even in Hollywood, they call it a matrix. There is a higher dimension to the reality on the earth. Something else is going on here on a higher level. And I'm saying that you need to get in touch with your God who, who is the actual spirit in the universe because it's, it's intelligent and it hears you. Any, anyone else? Yeah, yeah, Jordan, that concept of what you're talking about um, I believe, and you've, I'm sure you've read uh, William Blake, because he took the, the stories of the Bible and he called it our imagination that lives within us is actually God, I think, and uh, is very, very right along with what you're talking about. In the book of uh, Psalms and in the New Testament, has Jesus saying, have you, in the book, in the New Testament, there's a scripture where it has Jesus saying, uh, to the Pharisees and Sadducees, does not your scripture say that ye are gods? And if you go back to Psalms, it's, that's what it says. It gives you in the Bible reference works where that comes from. In the Old Testament, there is a scripture in Psalms that says that we are gods in that the, the progenitive life force in us has come from another place in the universe. Wherefore, we are the offspring of the uh, Elohim. We're the offspring of the gods. So we are, in point of God, in point of fact, in a matter of speaking, the offspring of gods. And that being the case, that's why Jesus uh, has Jesus saying to the Hebrews or to the Jews of his day, uh, does not your scripture say that ye are gods, that we are gods? So I'm just saying that uh, when you understand how these words work and what these terms mean, all of a sudden you've got a whole different story than what you thought what the Bible was saying. It's saying something totally different than what you thought. Yes? Is this planet you're talking about, is that, is that planet X Yeah, this, people that, talk about? I think, from mm -hmm. my limited understanding of planet X, uh, I asked Zachariah Sitchin about that, planet X, and if it was Nibiru. Mm -hmm. uh, I had him on my show, on my radio show. And I said to him, and I made the mistake, because I know Zachariah, and I should have known better. Mm -hmm. But I said to him, Zachariah, uh, so-and-so, this other gentleman, and I give his name, has written a book about Planet X. And can you tell me anything about that? And Zachariah said to me, I don't talk about other people's work. You wanted me to be a guest on your show? You talk about Zachariah Sitchin. I don't, we're not talking about somebody else. Oh, mm -hmm. oh well, thank you. And good morning, Lord. God bless you. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, but I've talked to him in private, and he, um, he was noncommittal, but he thought it was interesting that this is uh, a planet which is legitimately there. It's coming from what I guess from the southern hemisphere, coming from, from the deep south hemisphere, from like uh, over Antarctica, coming this way. So it's not coming from somewhere we can see it, but if you're down in Peru or in the mountains, you can see it coming from the south. We can? Yeah, yeah. Wow. So it's they've already picked, take, taken pictures of it, uh -huh. uh, so they know it's 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 legitimate. Yes, it's it's it is coming this way. Yes, it is seems to be about twice the size of the Earth. Um, yeah, they're referring to it as Planet X. Incidentally, mm -hmm. are you aware that Russia has a huge uh, project talking about Planet X all over Russia? There are signboards. I've seen pictures sent to me, uh, huge billboards with the planet showing it coming toward, and it says in, in Russian that uh, it's, it's almost here. Get ready. 
Uh, the Russians are the big signboard showing the Earth, the sun out in the back, and this huge planet coming. And it kind of got a, a stream like it's moving. And, and in Russian, it's saying, uh, it's coming. Get ready. Hmm. So all over Russia, May. they're talking about a planet that's coming into our vicinity. And, and what you have to appreciate, too, is that the planet, if it's twice the size of the Earth and comes into our solar system, the uh, David Talbot, I can talk for hours on this subject of, of the work of David Talbot, uh, the, the solar system as we know it today is not the same configuration of the solar system that may have existed 10,000 years ago. In other words, Saturn today is just a bright little star. Mm -hmm. Jupiter is a little bit brighter. Well, it's not a star, it's a planet, but it looks like a bright star. But according to the ancient peoples, they said that the configuration of our solar system was totally different. 10,000 to 12, 20,000 years, maybe 25,000 years ago was totally different. Saturn was much closer. Mars was much closer. Uh, different planets were further away. It was a different configuration. So at night, you would walk out and see this huge enormous planet with rings around it, that's how close Saturn was to us. Mm -hmm. And if you take a, a round circle around Saturn and turn it just at a right angle, it looks like an eye. Ah. The eye inside the circle, but the circle is now oblong because you turn the angle and now it looks like an eye looking at you. Mm. Mars, we're told, according to the, the theory that is now being worked out that Mars could very well have come through and caused some kind of an electrical frequency going between us and Saturn. Mm -hmm. You've seen the pictures of Mars where it has those jagged cuts in Mars. It looks like deep canyons on, on Mars. They're very heavily cut and they look like electrical shock waves going out from it. Mm -hmm. Many people have thought that that was like water uh, rivers and whatever. No, no, not at all. They now know for a certainty what those jagged, uh, like our, uh, what is it, um, out here in Arizona? Canyons. Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon. Yeah. There are huge, enormous canyons uh, which go for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles on Mars, far, far deeper, far, far bigger. Uh, and they say, well, those were, those were great canyons of water at one time. No, we now know what they are. They, it has been replicated in, in, on the scientific experiment, and they now know that those cuts on Mars were electrical discharges from Mars to another planet. Mm -hmm. It's like out here on these uh, power poles. If you get two of those power poles uh, lines too close together, they have to be a certain amount apart. If you get them too close together, the, the electricity, the, the static electricity coming through on the outside will arc. They'll, they'll jump. Mm -hmm. When it does, you've got problems. If you get two powerful lines, I mean really very powerful uh, lines and get them too close, they'll jump and boy when they do, now you've got an explosion. We now know that the Earth, as it rotates, as the Earth rotates, it generates electricity because it's, it's, it's rotating inside of its own atmosphere, which is causing friction, which gives us our electrical storms, tornadoes. It's because the Earth is rotating like a generator, generating electricity, and that electricity is grounded. It goes back into the ground, which goes down and heats up the lava, keeping it hot and bubbling, and so consequently, if another planet comes close to us, the electrical frequency, our electrical, biological and electrical frequency on this Earth would jump and hit the other planet. Mm -hmm. And so they are now able to see that that's what happened to Mars. Mars must have moved too close to another planet thousands of years ago, and it jumped. The spark jumped off of Mars and shot across and hit another planet. And that's why there are all, all this, that, uh, and that whole uh, orbit mm -hmm. that Mars is in are many, many uh, asteroids and many, many uh, meteors or whatever. It's because there was an electrical 
discharge that you wouldn't believe coming off of the, off the, off the surface of Mars that jumped out and hit another planet because it came too close. Mm -hmm. Well, they always call it the fiery planet, too, yes. don't they? Um, one other thing, do you have a favorite version of the Bible to read? Yes, Which I certainly one? do. It's called, it's called, um, it's my favorite one because it's got all kinds of interesting, great uh, footnotes that nobody will touch. Nobody else has it. And it's, um, it's called the Companion Bible. It's the, it's the King James Bible, but it's called the Companion Bible. Bible, and it's put out by Kregel, K-R-E-G-E-L, Kregel Company, Companion Bible. And if you call me at my office, I'll give you the ISBN number and the address of where to get it from. And uh, there are places around town you can get it over in Pasadena. It has a whole set of Kregel's Bibles. That one is sensational. They've got all kinds of interesting stuff in who the Hebrew, the Hebrew language was actually Phoenician Canaanite, gives you all the reference works. Uh, it tells you in their reference works that the entire New Testament is astral theology based on astrology, and it gives you all of the reference works and all the, the volumes to research. Um, just and it gives you numerology, Egyptology, tells you the real truth about where things come from. The Ark of the Covenant was borrowed from the Egyptian. It's an Egyptian story. The Ten Commandments, it says in, in, the, in the reference work in that Bible, was taken from the Egyptian concept of the Twelve Negative Confessions, as I said. Uh, that Bible is called the Companion Bible, is crammed, filled with interesting stuff, end quote that most people have never even heard. I'll say, hey, this is a reference work Bible. It's just telling you things that nobody else will tell you. So that's the one I would get, the companion Bible. But uh, give me a call at my office, and then I'll give you the actual ISBN number so you get the exact one. Because the King James Bible, it's uh, 818. Anybody can call me 24 hours a day. 818-705-3029. Come over and visit me if you want to. I don't care. I always try to make myself uh, available and accessible to everybody. I'm just a, I'm not the world's foremost authority on anything. I don't have to be. I'm just an ordinary man pursuing extraordinary knowledge. I'm fascinated with the world of the occult and how much we don't know. And I've spent 43 years of my life looking at stuff that most people don't even know exists. Yes. Yeah, and uh, <coughs> in Sitchin's... Uh book, The Lost Realms, he was looking at uh, where the earth stood still for 24 hours so Joshua could slaughter the Philistines. Oh, yeah. So he thought that, well, if it was 24 hours of light on one side of the planet, theoretically there should have been 24 <coughs> hours of darkness on the other. Yeah, Velikovsky. So, yeah. Well, so what he did was he checked, uh, Sitchin checked with the, um, the Mayan codexes in South America. Oh, and yeah. He found at the same period of time that uh, Joshua was supposed to have lived roughly 3,600 years ago, where they had their 24 hours of daylight. In South America, the sun didn't come up for 24 hours. It was dark. So he realized that evidently when Nibiru comes by, the gravity is so great, it literally stops our planet from rotating for about 24 hours as it moves on through. I love that. Yeah. That's trippy stuff. Also, when you mentioned that Bible, the Strong's Concordance works real well with oh, that. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Strong's Bible Concordance. I've got three copies of that thing. I like it so much, I went out and bought three copies. <laughs> and I open all three copies, and I read all three at one time. Because I want to leave that one there while I open another one, and that one opens this one, i got to open that one. It's Strong's Bible Concordance, but get the large print, not the small print. Because the small print is so microscopic, it'll bl you know, go blind. Large print, beautiful. Get the Strong's Bible Concordance, and every single word in the Bible, it tells you exactly what it means where it came from. It's a whole reference. It's, a, it's an incredible piece of work. Strong's Bible Concordance, large print. And the, uh, what did I say, the Companion Bible, King James Companion Bible. You get those two. Incidentally, you might want to get a book called um, 
it's very it's kind of expensive I think it's like 45 to 50 dollars and it's not really a big book but it's just expensive uh, called mythology's last gods in my opinion that's a that's a real trippy book for me I, I've got a lot of great books but that one in particular is a mind blower it's called mythology's last gods by Dr. Harwood, H-A-R-W-O-O-D, Dr. Harwood. Mythology's Last Gods, Dr. Harwood. It's a doctoral thesis put into a book form in which he goes back and examines the actual interesting history of the old ancient world, what really the words meant, where it really came from, what it was actually saying, what the Sumerians and the ancient Hebrews Phoenician Canaanites were actually saying what those words meant. That gets interesting. Incidentally, the very word Cana, you've heard of the, the marriage feast of Cana and the Canaanites. Cana, C-A-N-A-A-N, Cana, uh, translates from the Phoenician language. A word Cana means merchant banker. Hmm? Is that interesting? Cana, the land of Cana. Cana is merchant banker. Yes. Me? Yeah. Thank you, Jordan. I enjoyed it. Um, you leave absolutely no doubt that um, uh, I guess men still see themselves as God, and the women have a much lesser place. I particularly enjoyed the story of, uh, what, of the three fellows that went, was it to Abraham's house? Yeah, Abraham and his Yeah, and friends. two of them left, and they lowered themselves by uh, meeting women. So yeah. that's where falling in love, uh, much lower plane. Um, and it seems to me when Noah came out of the ark with his three sons and the gods, who are men walking amongst us. It's interesting too about the ark, is that well, no, nobody ever talks about the women, the wives. Well, I was going to bring that up. How yeah. are they going to redo it again without the women, or were they yeah. just going to ramble through here and uh, take their pick? So I wish you'd uh, kind of speak to that a little bit. Why is it that the, um, the men of the, uh, the gods in the Bible, uh, you made it very clear that they are gods, they are men walking amongst us. Mm -hmm. uh, would you speak to their women? I mean, would you speak about their women? Or do they have any? Oh, I would think so. Why, the, why, why do you take the position that the men are gods and the gods are indeed men? Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm uh, in that. according thank to you. the ancient, uh, thank you, the ancient Greeks uh, were not the only ones, but it comes to my mind, the ancient Greeks and the Romans, the ancient Romans, uh, they had equal, they had god, goddesses uh, who were deities also. And um, so if you're looking at the word god or gods as uh, in the context that I've used it tonight, and I'm not saying I'm right, I'm just giving you a concept that seems to fit the scriptures and seems to fit the, uh, uh, so much of the evidence that's now being uncovered by Zechariah Sitchin and many, many, many more people like him. Uh, are any of you uh, aware of the work of uh, Michael Cremo? You ever heard of Michael Cremo? Yeah. Michael Cremo is a very, very studious and, and, uh, and fascinating man who is a no-nonsense professional uh, archaeologist who is seeing, and, and I've attended his lectures and got many of his videos, and he is making a very good case for the possibility that man as we know him today has been on the earth for millions and millions of years and that there has been destruction, world destruction, cosmic destruction, many, many times in the past. And I'm thinking, well, that's well, that's what I'm reading in the Bible very well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, forbidden archaeology, and now there's two more books, uh, two large ones that have come out from him now. So he's got quite a bit. However, uh, Charlton Heston did a hour television special on Michael Cremo and his work. I've got it. It's beautifully done with Charlton Heston, the the host of the program. And they're interviewing, uh, <clears throat> it's called the, um, the Hidden History of Mankind or something like that. I've got that. It's very, very interesting. I mean, Michael Cremo makes a very legitimate, uh, you know, argument 
for the fact that maybe we've been on this earth for millions of years. I mean, when we hear about uh, archaeology, how the, how the archaeologists in, say, in Israel, they're digging down, they get these little pottery and whatever, and they're cleaning it off with their brushes, that, you know, that doesn't impress me. That's for NBC, that's for ABC, you know, Mr. and Mrs. America to watch. But when they are digging off the coast and the, and the North Sea, off the coast of England, the oil drillers are, are, are out there on the North Sea, and they are going all the way down into the ocean, and then drilling into the ocean to hit oil, and they're sucking up the stuff that they're cutting as it's coming up, and they're finding utensils, rings, and all kinds of interesting things. Hey, we're talking about under the Atlantic Ocean, how the hell long have something been down there under the Atlantic Ocean? Obviously, the Atlantic Ocean wasn't there at some time in history because there was stuff being brought up from the floor of the ocean, underneath the floor of the ocean. I'm just saying, hey, somebody better do their homework. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on here that we haven't been told about. So again, do you have any other question? Just a real quick comment about uh, women in the Bible. Uh, about three weeks ago, and I'll make the information available, uh, uh, Victor, who was here last week, his friend Linda Allen has an organization called, and she's an evangelist, uh, uh, aspiring, and she's, she ordains other ministers now, but she's got an organization called Women in God's Service, and the acronym is WINGS, but they, they study uh, women in the Bible. And yeah. It's very, very interesting. Every, they've got a series of lectures, all day, one day lectures. They've only done two so far. The last one was called Tough Women and it was a pretty yeah, tough uh, <laughs> sermon. <laughs> but we'll, we'll make that available if anybody's interested. Good. Yeah, uh, I think that there has been a war going on for a long, long time between men and women. I think that there has been for many, many, many centuries, for thousands of years, an undeclared war between men and women. I mean, I just, I think that that pretty well is obvious um, uh, because the, the, there was female divinities in the ancient world and then with the coming of Rome, the uh, more emphasis was given, even in the Greek, Greek system, it was almost divided between men and women gods, male and female gods, but with the coming of Rome, it was, became more apparent that God was a man, God was male. Uh, but if the Anunnaki, or what we've talked about tonight, uh, look like us, then maybe their women look like, you know, maybe they are, they have women also, and they would be extraterrestrial and, and of the same higher evolved creatures. So uh, again, I just think the concept that's in the Bible is very possibly exactly what's going on today, and that the Middle East, uh, things which are happening in the Middle East today, is again, as I said, not just mankind, but I think could be very much orchestrated by those extraterrestrials who are really running the things from behind the scene. That makes sense to me, yes. Do you think it's been a war between men and women or a war between men and men for the subjugation of women? No, I think between men and women. But there's always gonna be that, that other also. But I think, uh, I think there's been a war between uh, male and female. Uh, incidentally, I just remembered something I, I wanted to bring out. Uh, when it says that in Genesis, in Genesis uh, 2, where it said that Adam and Eve walked in the cool of the evening, God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening. Actually, the word walked with is translated, the Hebrew words imply uh, someone who hears steps, someone is, you know, when someone's walking and you hear them cracking on the leaves of something near you, you know someone's walking. That's what the word in Hebrew meant. So when it says that um, Adam and Eve walk with God, or God walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening, walk with most uh, Christians and Jews have assumed, well, that means that, that God was there with them in spirit and he was there with walking with. No, no, the actual word means heard the footsteps, walk with God, walk with Adam and Eve, meaning Adam and Eve could hear the footsteps of God. 
And I thought, wow, that's interesting. You could hear him walking in the bush. <laughs> Implications are horrendous for that. What are we talking about? Maybe he's still here. You know, I think you know, Steven Spielberg has many things, but stupid isn't one of them. And he's been talking about ETs and and um, close encounters of the third kind. And we've been told, you know, all these science fiction movies coming out of Hollywood. Uh, I think there's something to all of this. Yes. Yeah, in the Sitchin books, uh, these whole pantheon of gods on the planet, whether they're from India, uh, Rome, yeah. Greece, South America. They're all the same family with just each group has named them differently. And they were a family group. And the first, uh, I guess, guardian or god of the planet actually remained here for like over almost 900,000 years. And they subsequently changed leadership, but it was out of the same family. And uh, some of these warrior gods were women. And that was like uh, Aphrodite, and she's been given all kinds of names. She had rocket ships. Yeah, um, I know. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, again, it's, um, it's a fascinating story about the, the gods and goddesses and how they look like humans. I think they were, that's why we look like what we do, because we're made in the image and likeness of the Elohim, the Anunnaki, the gods. And that's why they can be right here in front of us and we'd never know it. And we've been told that, that you know, I've heard a lot of people in the military saying that the government knows that there are alien life forms here that look like us. And, uh, well, it makes sense. Maybe they're the ones that created us. They said that, you know, they make mankind look, to look like them and act like them. So anyway, uh, again, I was just, uh, if uh, Wendy is here and wants to make any final announcements, then I'm not going to take any more questions. Again, thank you.